A Smile of Fortune, Chapter 4 My little passage with Jacobus the merchant became known generally. One or two of my acquaintances made distant allusions to it. Perhaps the mulatto boy had talked. I must confess that people appeared rather scandalized, but not with Jacobus's brutality. A man I knew remonstrated with me for my hastiness. I gave him the whole story of my visit, not forgetting the tell-tale resemblance of the wretched mulatto boy to his tormentor. He was not surprised, no doubt, no doubt, what of it. In a jovial tone he assured me that there must be many of that sort. The elder Jacobus had been a bachelor all his life, a highly respectable bachelor, but there had never been open scandal in that connection. His life had been quite regular. It could cause no offense to anyone. I said that I had been offended considerably. My interlocutor opened with very wide eyes. Why? Because a mulatto lad got a few knocks? That was not a great affair, surely. I had no idea how insolent and untruthful these half-castes were. In fact, he seemed to think Mr. Jacobus rather kind than otherwise to employ that youth at all, a sort of amiable weakness which could be forgiven. This acquaintance of mine belonged to one of the old French families, descendants of the old colonists, all noble, all impoverished, and living a narrow domestic life in dull, dignified decay. The men, as a rule, occupy inferior posts in government offices or in business houses. The girls are almost always pretty, ignorant of the world, kind and agreeable, and generally bilingual. They prattle innocently, both in French and English. The emptiness of their existence passes belief. I obtained my entry into a couple of such households because some years before in Bombay, I had occasion to be of use to a pleasant, ineffectual young man who was rather stranded there, not knowing what to do with himself, or even how to get home to his island again. It was a matter of two hundred rupees or so, but when I turned up, the family made a point of showing their gratitude by admitting me to their intimacy. My knowledge of the French language made me specially acceptable. They had meantime managed to marry the fellow to a woman nearly twice his age, comparatively well off, the only profession he was really fit for. But it was not all cakes and ale. The first time I called on the couple, she spied a little spot of grease on the poor devil's pantaloons and made him a screaming scene of reproaches so full of sincere passion that I sat terrified as at a tragedy of Racine. Of course, there was never a question of the money I had advanced him, but his sisters, Miss Angelie and Miss Mary, and the aunts of both families who spoke quaint, archaic French of pre-revolution period and a host of distant relations, adopted me for a friend outright in a manner which was almost embarrassing. It was with the eldest brother. He was employed at a desk in my consignee's office, that I was having in this talk about the merchant Jacobus. He regretted my attitude and nodded his head sagely. An influential man, one never knew when one would need him. I expressed my immense preference for the shopkeeper of the two. At that my friend looked grave. What on earth are you pulling that long face about? I cried impatiently. He asked me to see his garden and I have a good mind to go some day. Don't do that, he said, so earnestly that I burst into a fit of laughter, but he looked at me without a smile. This was another matter altogether. At one time the public conscience of the island had been mightily troubled by my Jacobus. The two brothers had been partners for years in great harmony when a wandering circus came to the island and my Jacobus became suddenly infatuated with one of the lady riders. What made it worse was that he was married. He had not even the grace to conceal his passion. 
It must have been strong indeed to carry away such a large placid creature. His behavior was perfectly scandalous. He followed that woman to the Cape, and apparently traveled at the tail of that beastly circus to other parts of the world, in a most degrading position. The woman soon ceased to care for him, and treated him worse than a dog. Most extraordinary stories of moral degradation were reaching the island at that time. He had not the strength of mind to shake himself free. The grotesque image of a fat, pushing ship channeler enslaved by an unholy love spell fascinated me, and I listened rather open-mouthed to the tale as old as the world, a tale which had been the subject of legend, of moral fables, of poems, but which so ludicrously failed to fit the personality. What a strange victim for the gods! Meantime, his deserted wife had died. His daughter was taken care of by his brother, who married her as advantageously as was possible in the circumstances. Oh, the Mrs. Doctor, I exclaimed. You know that? Yes, a very able man. He wanted a lift in the world, and there was a good bit of money from her mother, besides the expectations. Of course, they don't know him, he added. The doctor nods in the street, I believe, but he avoids speaking to him when they meet on board a ship, as must happen sometimes. I remarked that this surely was an old story by now. My friend assented, but it was Jacobus's own fault that it was neither forgiven nor forgotten. He came back ultimately, but how? Not in a spirit of contrition, in a way to propitiate his scandalized fellow citizens, he must needs drag along with him a child, a girl. He spoke to me of a daughter who lives with him, I observed, very much interested. She's certainly the daughter of the circus woman, said my friend. She may be his daughter, too. I am willing to admit that she is. In fact, I have no doubt. But he did not see why she should have been brought into a respectable community to perpetuate the memory of the scandal, and that was not the worst. Presently, something much more distressing happened. That abandoned woman turned up, landed from a mail boat. What? Here? To claim the child, perhaps, I suggested? Not she, my friendly informant was very scornful. Imagine a painted, haggard, agitated, desperate hag been cast off in Mozambique by somebody who paid her passage here. She had been injured internally by a kick from a horse. She hadn't a cent on her own when she got ashore. I don't think she even asked to see the child, at any rate not till the last day of her life. Jacobus hired for her a bungalow to die in. He got a couple of sisters from the hospital to nurse her through these few months. If he didn't marry her in extremis, as the good sisters tried to bring about, it's because she wouldn't even hear of it. As the nun said, the woman died impenitent. It was reported that she ordered Jacobus out of the room with her last breath. This may be the real reason why he didn't go into mourning himself. He only put the child into black. While she was little, she was to be seen sometimes about the streets, attended by a negro woman. But since she became of age, to put her hair up, I don't think she has set foot outside that garden once. She must be over eighteen now. Thus my friend, with some added details, such as that he didn't think the girl had spoken to three people of any position in the island, that an elderly female relative of the brothers Jacobus had been induced by extreme poverty to accept the position of governant to the girl, as to Jacobus's business, which certainly annoyed his brother, it was a wise choice on his part. It brought him in contact only with strangers of passage, whereas any other would have given rise to all sorts of awkwardnesses. With his social equals. The man was not wanting in a certain tact, only he was naturally shameless. For why did he want to keep that girl with him? It was most painful for everybody. 
I thought suddenly and with profound disgust of the other Jacobus, and I could not refrain from saying slyly, I suppose if he employed her, say, as a scullion in his household, and occasionally pulled her hair or boxed her ears, the position would have been more regular, less shocking to the respectable class to which he belongs. He was not so stupid as to miss my intention, and shrugged his shoulders impatiently. You don't understand. To begin with, she's not a mulatto, and a scandal is a scandal. People should be given a chance to forget. I dare say it would have been better for her if she had been turned into a scullion or something of that kind. Of course, he's trying to make money in every sort of petty way, but in such a business there will never be enough for anybody to come forward. When my friend left me, I had a conception of Jacobus and his daughter existing, a lonely pair of castaways on a desert island, the girl sheltering in the house as if it were a cavern in a cliff and Jacobus going out to pick up a living for both on the beach, exactly like two shipwrecked people who always hope for some rescuer to bring them back at last into touch with the rest of mankind. But Jacobus's bodily reality did not fit in with this romantic view. When he turned up on board in the usual course, he sipped the cup of coffee placidly, asked me if I was satisfied, and I hardly listened to the harbor gossip he dropped slowly in his low, voice-saving enunciation. I had then troubles of my own, my ship chartered, my thoughts dwelling on the success of a quick round voyage. I had been suddenly confronted by a shortage of bags, a catastrophe, the stock of one especial kind, called pockets, seemed to be totally exhausted. A consignment was shortly expected. It was afloat on its way, but in meantime, the loading of my ship dead stopped. I had enough to worry about. My consignees, who had received me with such hardiness on my arrival, now in the character of my charterers, listened to my complaints with polite helplessness. Their manager, the old maidish thin man who so prudishly didn't even like to speak about the impure Jacobus, gave me the correct commercial view of the position. My dear captain, he was retracting his leathery cheeks into a condescending shark-like smile, we were not morally obliged to tell you of a possible shortage before you signed the charter party. It was for you to guard against the contingency of a delay, strictly speaking. But, of course, we shouldn't have taken any advantage. This is no one's fault, really. We ourselves have been taken unawares, he concluded primly, with an obvious lie. This lecture, I confess, had made me thirsty. Suppressed rage generally produces that effect, and as I strolled on aimlessly, I bethought myself of the tall earthenware pitcher in the captain's room of Jacobus's store. With no more than a nod to the man I found assembled there, I poured down a deep, cool draught on my indignation, then another, and then, becoming dejected, I sat plunged in cheerless reflections. The others read, talked, smoked, bandied over some unsubtle chaff, but my abstraction was respected, and it was without a word to anyone that I rose and went out, only to be quite unexpectedly accosted by Jacobus the outcast. Glad to see you, Captain. What, going away? You haven't been looking so well these last few days, I notice. Run down, eh? He was in his shirt sleeves, and his words were in the usual course of business, but they had a humane note. It was commercial amenity, but I had been a stranger to amenity in that connection. I do verily believe, from the direction of his heavy glance towards a certain shelf, that he was going to suggest the purchase of Clarkson's nerve tonic, which he kept in stock, when he said impulsively, I am rather in trouble with my loading. Wide awake under his sleepy, broad mask with glued lips, he understood at once. Had a movement of the head so appreciative that I relieved my exasperation by exclaiming, Surely there must be 
1,100 quarter bags to be found in the colony, it's only a matter of looking for them. Again, that slight movement of the big head, and in the noise of the activity of the street, that tranquil murmur, to be sure, but then people likely to have a reserve of quarter bags wouldn't want to sell. They'd need that size themselves. That's exactly what my consignees are telling me. Impossible to buy. Bosh. They don't want to. It suits them to have the ship hung up. But if I were to discover the lot, they would have to. Look here, Jacobus. You are the man to have such a thing up your sleeve. He protested with a ponderous swing of his big head. I stood before him helplessly, being looked at by those heavy eyes with a veiled expression as of a man after some soul-shaking crisis. Then suddenly, it's impossible to talk quietly here, he whispered, I am very busy. But if you could go and wait for me in my house, it's less than ten minutes walk. Oh yes, you don't know the way. He called for his coat and offered to take me there himself. He would have returned to the store at once for an hour or so to finish his business, and then he would be at liberty to talk over with me that matter of quarter bags. This program was breathed out at me through slightly parted, still lips. His heavy, motionless glance rested upon me, placid as ever, the glance of a tired man, but I felt that it was searching, too. I could not imagine what he was looking for in me, and kept silent, wondering. I am asking you to wait for me in my house till I am at liberty to talk this matter over. You will? Why, of course, I cried. But I cannot promise. I dare say not, I said. I don't expect a promise. I mean, I can't even promise to try the move I've in mind. One must see first, hmm? All right. I'll take the chance. I'll wait for you as long as you like. What else have I to do in this infernal hole of a port? Before I had uttered my last words, he had set off at a swinging pace. We turned a couple of corners and entered a street, completely empty of traffic, of semi-rural aspect, paved with cobblestones, nestling in grass tufts. The house came to the line of the roadway, a single story on an elevated basement of rough stones, so that our heads were below the level of the windows as we went along. All the jealousies were tightly shut, like eyes, and the house seemed fast asleep in the afternoon sunshine. The entrance was at the side, in an alley even more grass-grown than the street, a small door simply on the latch. With a word of apology as to showing me the way, Jacobus proceeded me up a dark passage and led me across the naked parquet floor of what I supposed to be the dining room. It was lighted by three glass doors which stood wide open onto a veranda, or rather loggia, running its brick arches along the garden side of the house. It was really a magnificent garden, smooth green lawns and a gorgeous maze of flower beds in the foreground displayed around a basin of dark water framed in a marble rim and in the distance the massed foliage of varied trees concealing the roofs of other houses the town might have been miles away it was a brilliantly colored solitude drowsing in a warm voluptuous silence where the long still shadows fell across the beds and in shady nooks the massed colors of the flowers had an extraordinary magnificence of effect i stood entranced jacobus grasped me delicately above the elbow impelling me to a half turn to the left i had not noticed the girl before she occupied a low deep wickerwork armchair and I saw her in exact profile, like a figure in a tapestry, and as motionless. Jacobus released my arm. This is Alice, he announced tranquilly, and his subdued manner of speaking made it sound so much like a confidential communication that I fancied myself nodding understandingly and whispering, I see, I see. Of course I did nothing of the kind. Neither of us did anything, 
We stood side by side, looking down at the girl. For quite a time she did not stir, staring straight before her as if watching the vision of some pageant passing through the garden in the deep, rich glow of light and the splendor of flowers. Then, coming to the end of her reverie, she looked round and up. If I had not at first noticed her, I am certain that she too had been unaware of my presence till she actually perceived me by her father's side. The quickened upward movement of the heavy eyelids, the widening of the languid glance passing into a fixed stare, put that beyond doubt. Under her amazement there was a hint of fear, and then came a flash as of anger. Jacobus, after uttering my name fairly loud, said, Make yourself at home, Captain. I won't be gone long, and went away rapidly. Before I had time to make a bow, I was left alone with the girl, who I remembered suddenly had not been seen by any man or woman of that town since she had found it necessary to put up her hair. It looked as though it had not been touched again since that distant time of first putting up. It was a mass of black, lustrous locks, twisted anyhow, high on her head, with long, untidy wisps hanging down on each side of the clear, sallow face, a mass so thick and strong and abundant that nothing but to look at it gave you a sensation of heavy pressure on the top of your head and an impression of magnificently cynical untidiness. She leaned forward, hugging herself with crossed legs, a dingy, amber-colored, flounced wrapper of some thin stuff revealed the young, supple body drawn together tensely in the deep, low seat as if crouching for a spring. I detected a slight, quivering start or two, which looked uncommonly like bounding away. They were followed by the most absolute immobility. The absurd impulse to run out after Jacobus, for I had been startled too, once repressed, I took a chair, placed it not very far from her, sat down deliberately, and began to talk about the garden, caring not what I said, but using a gentle caressing intonation as one talks to soothe a startled wild animal. I could not even be certain that she understood me. She never raised her face, nor attempted to look my way. I kept on talking only to prevent her from taking flight. She had another of those quivering, repressed starts which made me catch my breath with apprehension. Ultimately, I formed a notion that what prevented her perhaps from going off in one great nervous leap was the scantiness of her attire. The wicker armchair was the most substantial thing about her person. What she had under that dingy, loose, amber wrapper must have been on the most flimsy and airy character. One could not help being aware of it. It was obvious. I felt it actually embarrassing at first, but that sort of embarrassment is got over easily by a mind not enslaved by narrow prejudices. I did not avert my gaze from malice. I went on talking with ingratiating softness, the recollection that most likely she had never before been spoken to by a strange man adding to my assurance. I don't know why an emotional tenseness should have crept into the situation, but it did, and just as I was becoming aware of it, a slight scream cut short my flow of urbane speech. The scream did not proceed from the girl. It was emitted behind me and caused me to turn my head sharply. I understood at once that the apparition on the doorway was the elderly relation of Jacobus, the companion, the governante. While she remained thunderstruck, I got up and made her a low bow. The ladies of Jacobus's household evidently spent their days in light attire. The stumpy old woman with a face like a large wrinkled lemon, beady eyes and a shock of iron-gray hair, was dressed in a garment of some ash-colored, silky, light stuff. It fell from her thick neck down to her toes with the simplicity of an unadorned nightgown, and made her appear truly cylindrical. She exclaimed, 
How did you get here? Before I could say a word, she vanished, and presently I heard a confusion of shrill protestations in a distant part of the house. Obviously, no one could tell her how I got there. In a moment, with great outcries from two Negro women following her, she waddled back to the doorway, infuriated. What do you want here? I turned to the girl. She was sitting straight up now, her hands posed on the arms of the chair. I appealed to her. Surely, Miss Alice, you will not let them drive me out into the street. Her magnificent black eyes narrowed. Long and shape swept over me with an indefinable expression. Then, in a harsh, contemptuous voice, she let fall in French a sort of explanation. Sieste, Papa. I made another low bow to the old woman. She turned her back on me in order to drive away her black henchwoman. Then, surveying my person in a peculiar manner with one small eye nearly closed and her face all drawn up on that side as if with a twinge of toothache, she stepped out on the veranda, sat down in a rocking chair some distance away, and took up her knitting from a little table. Before she started, as it she plunged one of the needles into the mop of her gray hair and stirred it vigorously. Her elementary nightgown sort of frock clung to her ancient stumpy and floating form. She wore white cotton stockings and flat brown velvet slippers. Her feet and ankles were obtrusively visible on the footrest. She began to rock herself slightly while she knitted. I had resumed my seat and kept quiet, for I mistrusted that old woman. What if she ordered me to depart? She seemed capable of any outrage. She had snorted once or twice. She was knitting violently. Suddenly she piped at the young girl in French a question which I translate colloquially. What's your father up to now? The young creature shrugged her shoulders so comprehensively that her whole body swayed within the loose wrapper, and in that unexpectedly harsh voice which yet had a seductive quality to the senses, like certain kinds of natural rough wines one drinks with pleasure, it's some captain, leave me alone, will you? The chair rocked quicker, the old thin voice was like a whistle. You and your father make a pair. He would stick at nothing. That's well known, but I didn't expect this. I thought it high time to air some of my own French. I remarked modestly but firmly that this was business. I had some matters to talk over with Mr. Jacobus. At once she piped out a derisive poor innocent. Then, with a change of tone, the shop's for business. Why don't you go to the shop to talk with him? The furious speed of her fingers and knitting needles made one dizzy and with squeaky indignation sitting here staring at that girl. Is that what you call business? No, I said suavely. I call this pleasure an unexpected pleasure. And unless Miss Alice objects, I have turned to her. She flung at me an angry and contemptuous, don't care, and leaning her elbow on her knees, took her chin in her hand, a Jacobus chin undoubtedly, and those heavy eyelids, those black irritated stare reminded me of Jacobus too, the wealthy merchant, the respected one. The design of her eyebrows also was the same, rigid and ill-omened. Yes, I traced in her resemblance to both of them. It came to me as a sort of surprising remote inference that both these Jacobuses were rather handsome men after all. I said, oh, then I shall stare at you till you smile. She favored me again with an even more viciously scornful, don't care. The old woman broke in blunt and shrill. Hear his impudence, and you too don't care. Go at least and put some more clothes on, sitting there like this before the sailor riffraff. The sun was about to leave the pearl of the ocean for other seas, for other lands. The walled garden full of shadows blazed with color 
as if the flowers were giving up the light absorbed during the day, the amazing old woman became very explicit. She suggested to the girl a corset and a petticoat, with a cynical unreserve which humiliated me. Was I of no more account than a wooden dummy? The girl snapped out, shan't. It was not the naughty retort of a vulgar child. It had a note of desperation. Clearly my intrusion had somehow upset the balance of their established relations. The old woman knitted with furious accuracy, her eyes fastened down on her work. Oh, you are the true child of your father, and that talks of entering a convent, letting herself be stared at by a fellow. Leave off, shameless thing, old sorceress, the girl uttered distinctly, preserving her meditative pose, chin in hand, and a faraway stare over the garden. It was like the quarrel of the kettle and the pot. The old woman flew out of the chair, banged down her work, and with a great play of thick limb perfectly visible in that weird clinging garment of hers, strode at the girl, who never stirred. I was experiencing a sort of trepidation when, as if awed by that unconscious attitude the aged relative of Jacobus turned short upon me, she was, I perceived, armed with a knitting needle, and as she raised her hand, her intention seemed to be to throw it at me like a dart, but she only used it to scratch her head with, examining me with the while at close range, one eye nearly shut, and her face distorted by a whimsical one-sided grimace. My dear man, she asked abruptly, do you expect any good to come of this? I do hope so indeed, Miss Jacobus. I tried to speak in the easy tone of an afternoon caller. You see, I am here after some bags. Bags? Look at that now. Didn't I hear you holding forth to that graceless wretch? You would like to see me in my grave, uttered the motionless girl hoarsely. Grave? What about me? buried alive before I am dead for the sake of a thing blessed with such a pretty father, she cried, and turning to me, you're one of these men who he does business with. Well, why don't you leave us in peace, my good fellow? It was said in a tone, thus leave us in peace. There was a sort of ruffianly familiarity, a superiority, a scorn in it. I was to hear it more than once for you would show an imperfect knowledge of human nature if you thought that this was my last visit to that house, where no respectable person had put foot for ever so many years. No, you would be very much mistaken if you imagined that this reception had scared me away. First of all, I was not going to run before a grotesque and ruffianly old woman, and then you mustn't forget these necessary bags. That very first evening, Jacobus made me stay to dinner. After, however, telling me loyally that he didn't know whether he could do anything at all for me, he had been thinking it over. It was too difficult, he feared, but he did not give up in so many words. We were only three at table. The girl, by means of repeated, won't, shan't, and don't care, having conveyed and affirmed her intention not to come to the table, not to have any dinner, not to move from the veranda, the old relative hopped about in her flat slippers and piped indignantly. Jacobus towered over her and murmured placidly in his throat. I joined jocularly from a distance, throwing in a few words for which under the cover of the night I received secretly a most vicious poke in the ribs from the old woman's elbow, or perhaps her fist. I restrained her cry, and all the time the girl didn't even condescend to raise her head to look at any of us. All this may sound childish, and yet that stony, petulant sullenness had an obscurely tragic flavor. And so we sat down to the food around the light of a good many candles, while she remained crouching out there, staring in the dark as if feeding her bad temper on the heavily scented air of the admirable garden.
Before leaving me, I said to Jacobus that I would not come next day to hear if the bag affair had made any progress. He shook his head slightly at that. I'll haunt your house daily till you pull it off. You'll be always finding me here. His faint melancholy smile did not part his lips. That will be all right, Captain. Then seeing me to the door, very tranquil, he murmured earnestly the recommendation, Make yourself at home, and also the hospitable hint about there always being a plate of soup. It was only on my way to the quay, down the ill-lighted streets, that I remembered I had been engaged to dine that very evening with the S. family. Though vexed with my forgetfulness, it would be rather awkward to explain, I couldn't help thinking that it had procured me a more amusing evening, and besides, business, the sacred business. And a barefooted negro who overtook me at a run and bolted down the landing steps, I recognized Jacobus's boatman, who must have been feeding in the kitchen. His usual good night, sir, as I went up my ship ladders, had a more cordial sound than on previous occasions.